Thank you, Carl, and good evening, everybody. And it's great to see so many people here, despite the temptations on the box next door. We'd all like to be there as well. Thank you very much again, Joan Committee, for inviting me back to McGill. I spoke here two years ago, and you can claim another first for McGill, Joe. Um, at that stage, I was looking at some of the work um, I'd been asked to do in terms of the child deaths report and indeed the Roscommon case. And I had come to the conclusion that the HSE, as it was, was not fit for purpose in terms of child welfare and protection. Um, it was, that was the piece that was remembered. And I am very pleased that two years on, which is a very, very short period of time in terms of how things happen for children in this country, that we are getting to the point where we will have a dedicated agency called the Child and Family Support Agency who will look after the needs of children, not all of whom are vulnerable, but who may be on that trajectory, and most importantly, that will act with family and with community to prevent problems for growing. Because that, I think, in all of the work that I have done, the thing that upset me most, and it ties up very much with the statement of the first law, is that one could see that children were getting into trouble and nothing was done. Support wasn't put in, sometimes too much support was, was put in, but without a coherent plan. And the neglect of children. We all kind of pull back in horror when children are abused, as we should, but the neglect of children, not feeding them, not clothing them, not caring for them, not sending them to school, denies very fundamentally their rights as a child and as a human being. And I think that the, those messages, which are not the strident ones, if you like, are really very important. Thank you, Joe, for, for rescuing me. Tonight, I'm going to kind of keep my remarks within a 22-year period, and I promise not to go on forever. Um, but it just so happens that in September 1992, Ireland ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. That convention outlines the responsibility of state parties to protect and promote children's rights through laws, policies and practice. We have come a long way for children in Ireland since 1991. At that point, there's still a long road to travel, let me hasten to add, but we have made progress. We were just coming out not out of a jet because I returned to work in Ireland from England in 1990. Um, we were just coming out of a dreadful depression, again, immigration, etc., everything that we're now yet again familiar with. The Child Care Act of 1991 was on the statute book. And let me just remind us that that replaced the 1908 Act. I had worked and lived in England, trained to be a social worker there, had about five changes of legislation as evidence grew about what was needed. And here, we were still reliant on, a, on an act that really had its history and its, its ethos in poor law thinking. In 1992, Ireland's population was 3.5 million. Children at that stage, that's children and young people, not to 18, comprised 34% of that, 1 million, 200, just over 200,000. Today, we have a population of four and a half million. And again, children are about a, 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 quarter of, a quarter of this. We have one million, again, just over 200,000 children. The changes in Irish society have been very rapid over these 20 years. We've moved to live in cities or on the outskirts of cities. We've smaller families and we have diverse family life. And yet, sadly, again, our laws have not moved to cope with the changes, to understand the changes, and to include all our children in. For example, 2010, the Civic Partnership Bill, but children who are being raised in families where the parents are of same sex do not yet have equal rights to a relationship with both their parents. The year following our ratification of the Convention in 1993, Judge Catherine McGuinness delivered her report on the Gilkenny incest case. And I sometimes think, do we realise what a debt of gratitude we owe to that woman in terms of the work she did, both in her, her various positions uh, as, as a judge, but also with that very important case. Because she, for the first time, shone a light on what life was like for some children 
in families. A young girl, you may remember, a young woman, was um, a minor, was abused, was dreadfully, dreadfully abused. And we in Ireland had turned our eyes away. There was lots of red flags, there was lots of evidence, but we didn't see it. She told us then, Judge McGuinness, that we needed to am amend Bunrath na Heron, that we needed to have a statement in there that gave express rights to children, because she knew from her work and from that case how vulnerable children were, were when they weren't part of loving and caring families. And most Irish children are, and I think we sometimes forget that, most Irish children are doing very well. On all the well-being indicators, they score very highly. And when they're asked, are they happy with their parents? Yes, they are. And most of our children have loving and caring parents. And it's not just children who are at home with their families who say they're doing well. Many of our children in care are living in very good foster homes or in good residential um, settings and they are doing well as well. So we have things that we have to remember. But I suppose we are concerned with the children who are not doing so well. And the children, I was a member of the Ryan Commission who looked at institutional abuse in this country over a long time span. And the children who were placed in institutions were children often from big families, children from lone parents, lone, who was parented by a mum alone, and we put them into, into institutions and we used our 1908 Act and then we forgot about them. And I think all of us recognise that when the Ryan Report was finally published in 2009, that the country was suffused with anger, with shame. And I want us not to forget that, not to forget what happened, because it happened in our name and we were all part of the society. We've had a number of reports, I'm not going to go through them all, institutions, Ryan was the big one, clerical abuse, Murphy, Ferns, Cloyne, family abuse, the West of Ireland farmer, Kelly Fitzgerald, Monagheer and Roscommon. And I think out of that what we know is that sometimes as a society we have left children in situations to fend for themselves when we as adults would not have been capable of doing it. And I think this morning that the word resourcefulness was used. Many of those children were extremely resourceful and they survived despite what happened to them. And I had the pleasure of speaking to over 800 of them who came to talk to us in the Ryan Commission. And I was just so impressed with how they had done. And one of the women said to me, Nora, if we had been given an education, we would have run the world. And they could. They were absolutely excellent. So where are we now? As we're here in Glinties in 2012, we're approaching the 20th anniversary of our commitment to enshrining the principles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I am encouraged by the strides we have made. I have to say that most of those strides are very recent. We had argued in Bernardo's, as had other organisations, that we needed a proper minister for children. And I remember teasing some of our Minister for States in the past, saying, all I want for you is for you to be a proper minister. Are you not just delighted that that's what we're looking for? We now have a proper minister for children, a full voice around the Cabinet table. And I am very delighted with that. We also have some other important things happening that Judge McGuinness looked for when she looked closely at what happened in Kilkenny. We're having children first being put on a statutory basis. And a previous colleague of mine, whom you all listened to this morning, Madeleine Clark, in 1987 or 1988, I can't remember exactly, Bernardo's and I think the ISPCC were the only organisations who were saying we need to have to report that when we know something is happening to a child, we should have a duty to report it. It's very straightforward. Nobody has ever explained to me when or why you would not report if you knew that a child was being abused. Yet, it has taken us until now to come, to, to come that far forward and to recognise that we owe that to children, children who are in trouble. Most importantly, and above all else, the Irish public, Republic will be given an opportunity to vote on a referendum to strengthen children's rights in the Constitution this autumn, and I'm quoting the Minister, marking what will hopefully be a new era for our state in how we respect, value and protect children. 
and in my view, this would be a fitting tribute to the children that we were unable to protect and also to the work of Judge Catherine McGuinness. In addition, and I, as I said to you two years ago, I, I, I said here, I said, look, the HSE is not working for children and families. Now again, we have a proposed establishment for the Child and Family Support Agency. And it is to start in January 2001. And I must say, I do like things to be timetabled because then you know that there's some hope of progress and you can call people to account if it doesn't happen. I said the reason we needed a standalone agency was because there was a lack of leadership, there was a lack of national standards, there was no clear assessment model or framework, and all of that, I'm very hopeful, will now be put into place. I must give one caveat, though. The Minister asked me to work as part of the task force that would uh, you know, offer her some advice and guidelines as to what this agency, new agency would look like. And we started from putting the child at the centre and saying, if I'm a child in Ireland, if I am in a situation where I'm going to need more support than my family can give me for whatever reason, what do I want? And we are recommending that many of the services that have stood aside, that have left the job, perhaps, to social workers when they should have been involved, that we are suggesting that they come together to form this new agency. It has a number of advantages in that it will give the opportunity to make sure that we work cooperatively, that there's a cohesive group, and that they are arranged around the child, and that nobody steps away. I think it is likely that the Minister will find that there are some professional groupings who don't want to be part of that, who want to remain where they are, even though where they are is changing by the moment. And I'm hoping that the government will very much stick to what has been recommended. They can do better things, of course, if they wish. But if we don't create this agency with the National Education Welfare Board, the family support services that are around the country, organisations like Bernardo's, the community, uh, the adolesc children adolescent mental health services, very importantly, being part of this new agency, then it will fail and it had been better for us that we hadn't tried at all. It is really important and we really need this government who have made a great start to keep with it. In the work that myself and Dr. Shannon did together on the deaths of children who were in care or known to the system, too often there were issues of mental health, mental health issues beginning to emerge and nobody in sight for, someone, for a social worker to refer this child to. I'm a social worker. On your own, you, you can do very little. You can work actively with families. You can hear what children want to think. But there has to be other services ranged around as well. And it was very depressing to know that it has been government policy, it has been the law of the land for a number of years, that children aged 16 to 18, young people, should be dealt with by the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, and that still they are sent into adult psychiatry wards. That should not be allowed to continue, and the only way to stop it is for us all to gather and work together and work for children. So we're doing, we're doing a bit better than we, than we were, but there's one issue that has continued to dog Irish life and Irish children. And I'm talking about the impact of generational and intergenerational poverty on our vulnerable children and communities. There is a significant crossover between child welfare and child poverty. I am not suggesting for a moment, and indeed I know much better, that child abuse and child welfare issues doesn't cr crop up right across our society. But the pressures of ongoing poverty, the issues that arise from that, and in communities, and you know when you go into them, that are so disadvantaged over generations that people in the communities have sometimes themselves given up the difficulties that that's created. And during all our days of Celtic Tigers or whatever, we did nothing to really move and change the goalposts with relation to childhood poverty. Nine, 2002, I think the Celtic Tiger was just beginning to roar away then. 
there was a commitment from the then government, Taoiseach Bertie Ahern and Minister for Social Community and Family Affairs, Dermot Ahern, they launched national, the National Anti-Poverty Strategy. The commitment was to reduce consistent poverty to 2% from 6. Ten years on, consistent poverty rate remains static at 6.2%. And when we had money, we put money, we did, we increased the amount of income supports. But it's not just about income supports. It's also about services and it's about access to services. In particular, and somebody spoke about it this morning, uh, or maybe this afternoon, and it's one that I have a particular bee in my bonnet about, is education, education, education. We know that children, young people, will not get on in today's world or for, the, for many generations without a good standard of education. If I tell you, I think it was Don actually who spoke about it today, if I tell you that in 1980, one in three children in disadvantaged areas left our primary schools unable to read and write, and that that figure continues, and we have not been able to eradicate it. So I would be very much on the view that we need to do something about our literacy skills and about our basic numeracy skills, so that we are not continuing to export children and young people who can't make it here or anywhere else because they don't have the basic skills available to them. And I think it should become a national issue for us to look at where we're going wrong. We prided ourselves for a long time on the strength of our educational establishment. We said we did well. I think I remember some discussion um, when people were, as indeed they have a right to look for more, for more money for their job, and they wanted to be credited with the um, Celtic Tiger because of our good educational system. I've never heard anybody saying, please take away my money because children are leaving my school unable to read and unable to write to a satisfactory conclusion. One of the things that did help lower the rate of poverty during our Celtic years was the payment of the child benefit. It is directly correlated to lessening to somewhat the extent of relative poverty. The debate over the last few weeks, you'll know, we're back again. Are we taxing it or are we, are we going to means test it? I note yet again that we've been told that we can't tax it because the IT systems in the Department of Finance does not talk to the IT systems in the Department of Social Welfare, so they don't know who's getting child benefit because, as you know, it's a payment to women. Bernardo's take the very strong view that child benefit should not be means tested. By all means, tax it for our wealthier families. And I know that some of them went on RTE to say that they shouldn't be getting it. Give it back, don't claim it. But it is an important, an important money for families, particularly for families who are working but who are on very poor wages. So if we have a systems failure, Please don't have children pay the price for yet another systems, systems failure. I'm nearly finished. I just want to point out one or two other things to us. A recent Social Justice Ireland report indicates that we are not succeeding at protecting our most vulnerable during this, these years of austerity. In fact, Ireland's poorest families exper experienced an income drop of almost 20% in one year, while the income of the richest increased by 4%. In 2010, the top 10% of the population received almost 14 times more disposable income than the poorest 10%. It was eight times more in 1980. What this tells me, and us I hope, is that successive budget decisions have not spread austerity evenly. Targeted, they targeted low and middle income earners and we are seeing the impact of that in families across the country and I'm sure that you are as well. There are very many children and families who never benefited from our tiger. They continued to live in poverty and disadvantage throughout the last decade. And I am really pleased this morning for me there was a lot of really good work being done there and we need that type of work to continue because clearly no organisation, no state by itself 
can help to, to, to solve all these problems. It's essential, therefore, that the new agency, that not, it's not seen as the only player in the goal of reducing poverty. We need a whole of government approach. We need all of the departments and their ministers to work together for solutions that will deliver the kind of reform we need. And we need them to work with other interested parties who want to deliver the same ends. So lots of working together, not just in the voluntary and community sector, not just in the government sector, but across all the sectors, because I don't know of any other way that we're going to solve this. We really need strong political and policy will to ensure that the programme for government, this programme for government, that their commitment to combat child poverty is pursued. And we have dwindling resources, but we are making decisions about the way that we spend it, whatever resources we have. It's not just happening to us. In the debates that followed the publication of the Ryan Report, our present Taoiseach Eamon Gilmore quoted James Connolly's challenge to the Labour Party to achieve a country, and I quote, where every child on Irish soil will, by the mere fact of its existence, be an heir to and partner in all that the country produces, will have the same right to an assured existence as the citizen has today to his citizenship. Deputy Gilmore followed this by saying, more than 100 years later, the 21st century must become the century that the Irish people hold true to and deliver on our obligations to all our children and young people. I wholeheartedly endorse those words. We are living through difficult economic times, no easy decision and no easy wins. But I want us to put our children first when we're making the kind of choices that none of us want to have to make. We need that because we need to deliver opportunity, possibility and hope. Anything less is a failure on our part to deliver the kind of childhoods and the kind of society that will make us strong long into the future. Minister and colleagues here, it is crucial we do one thing and we get it right in 2012. Key thing for me, we get the wording of the children's referendum right, we give parents who are the best advocates for their children the possibility to further protect and strengthen the rights of their children. We make it happen for children and families in 2012. And I say to all those of us who are over 18, some of us long since gone over that, who can vote to vote, please vote yes for children. They don't have the vote. I know they're considering it bringing it down on the Constitutional Committee, whatever they're setting up. But they're relying on us, and we cannot let them down again. Thank you.